Amen. So from the old version, Paul saying, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Ah, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. Amen. Son or daughter. And if a son then an heir of God through Christ. So then reading it from the NIV, what I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights. King James there has adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God hath made you also an heir. Wonderful blessings for us from God's word. And I have an outline in the bulletin there. You can take a look at it. And I'll try to explain why I chose those. Sometimes I rack my brains as how I would, how I would outline it, how I see Paul here, the Holy Spirit, teaching us. What is he trying to say to us? So I got it down into three points. I, I like to a three, and I'll try to keep it down it's fairly simple. But number one, the dispensation of the law, I think, is what he's really talking about at the start. So we can explain that. Then the incarnation of the Son, obviously, right? The fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, the incarnation which means the enfleshment, right? God becomes flesh. And then number three, the adoption. The NIV doesn't use the word adoption. Why well, I wanted to read it in the King James, because it, it, the Greek word is adoption there, the adoption of the believer. So if you want to link those together, the dispensation of the law is done, right? The period of the law. The incarnation of the Son has come, Christ has come, Therefore, number three, we are the adopted believer. The adoption of believers is a very real and a very true thing. You are an adopted son and daughter of Christ if you've come to Christ by faith. So I think those are the topics. Let's look at those. And, I, and, and again, no longer slaves. Slaves really a better translation there than servant or bond servant might be okay. Really was slavery in the ancient world. So probably the better translation, we are no longer children. We're supposed to grow up, right? Or slaves. We're no longer slaves. We're joint heirs. So let's take a look at now. I'll explain what I mean on number one, the dispensation of the law. It's a word we don't use too often. But by dispensation, we mean time period and, or epoch or era. Does that make sense? So what was the dispensation of the law? It began when in Old Testament history? Not with Noah, not with Adam and Eve. Later, right? Moses. Right, the great lawgiver. God's the great lawgiver, actually, of course, but through Moses, the Ten Commandments, through Moses, the Sinai, the Sinaitic Covenant, we call it the Mosaic Covenant, the period of the law, the dispensation of the law began and extended for a long time, right? Really, up until the time of Christ. So that's what we mean by the dispensation of the law. And I, to, as I looked at this and prayed about it, I see this is what Paul's really talking about. He's referring to it as a period of childhood. But now it's time to grow up, <laughs> right? If you look back at, now we've been studying this book, look back at chapter 3, verse 19. Uh, from 3, verse 19. What then was the purpose of the law, right? Or wherefore then serveth the law? It was added, right? It was added after all the early patriarchs. And it is ended, it's come to an end. When? at least at the cross, right, or at the advent of Christ, if you will, right? When Jesus came, that was the end of the period of the law. So let's now, let's look at these verses in Galatians that we're looking at today. Galatians 4, 1. 
You see, he refers to that period of time as a period of childhood in a way. It's a bit of a slam in a way against the legalists, against legalism, if you think about it. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, verse 1, he's no different from a slave or a bond servant. Although he owns a whole estate. It makes sense, doesn't it? You could think of a very wealthy family, and they have a little boy, and he's going to inherit it all, but he's just a kid. So he just does what daddy and mommy tell him to do. He, he doesn't appreciate all the money. I mean, he might be spoiled rotten, but he still hasn't entered into the possession of all that wealth. And that's what he's, all he's saying there, that the Jews are that child, that period. They're heirs of the promises of God, right? The Messiah would come through the Jews, through the Abrahamic covenant. We've studied that in this book. But in Paul's thinking, that was a period of childhood. That dispensation pointed the way to the fullness of times, right? To the days in which we live in, hallelujah, when Christ has come. So remember, he's refuting the legalists, he's refuting the Judaizers. They've come into these young churches and they're trying to say, no, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the law. We understand what people are saying, what Paul's saying about faith, but it's more than that. And he's saying, no, it's by grace through faith are ye saved. Of course, he would write Romans right, to really make the point. But Galatians makes the same point, really. In a veiled way, Paul is calling these false teachers, these legalists, immature children who are going backwards. And it can happen in Christian churches as well. It can happen with pastors who preach legalism to their congregation, who lay down the law and say, if you come to this church, you've got to do this. You've got to dress this way. You've got to not do this when you're out of the doors. You can't be a member here. And it's legalism. We have to be careful of this. We want to preach grace. You're under the grace of God. The Holy Spirit will tell you what you should or shouldn't do. Don't let me tell you. Let the Holy Spirit tell you. Maybe he'll tell you through me, if I'm preaching, you know, that's possible. But it's God who tells you how to live, right? God's word that tells you how to live. It's not because a man stands up in front and says, this is what you've got to do. And this is what he's refuting here, I think, if you really read between the lines and look at this. Um, and, and by the way, this charge that he's making against the Jewish legalists can be made against all religion. All man-made religion, which is religion, <laughs> other than just true Christianity, the true Christian faith. All man-made religion preaches works. They all do. Every one of them. Think of one that does. The only one that doesn't is, is Christianity. It's a true Christian faith. We preach grace, faith, right? That's how you're saved. Every other religion says, you've got to do this and that. You've got to keep the sacraments. You've got to keep the law. You've got to be good. You've got to be a good person. You've got to not offend others. You can get to nirvana, but you can achieve that state only by doing this, learning how to meditate just right and leaving your body behind. And finally, when you die, you'll enter into whatever religion you're talking about. It's always having to do with works. And this is not true of the Christian faith. This is what sets our faith apart, right? And it's a wonderful thing that God paid the full price. We do not earn heaven. Jesus earned heaven. And, you know, to praise the Lord because we can't earn it. So look at verse 2 here. Paul compares the Jews, I think, to a little child. He says he's subject to guardians or tutors and trustees. Paul may be thinking of a wealthier Roman family that would have uh, tutors for their children. They didn't have public schools and organized schools in those days. If you want to educate your kid, you have to hire somebody to do it yourself. So he's subject to guardians or trustees or governors until the time set by his father. For the Jews, age 12, of course, we know was a major point, right? Jesus in the temple, 12 years old, right? Discussing with the doctors of the law. Did you not know I had to be in the house of my father? I'm 12 years old, right? And that became a rite of passage for the Jews. Pretty young when they considered a boy a man in those days and to be a, a son of the law at that age. Back in, if you look back at chapter 3, verse 24, let's go back and look at that one just to review. Uh, look at 324. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, see that verse 25. Check it out in your version. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. That's the NIV. We're no longer just under the law. And he's just making the same point here, but he's using an illustration of childhood. So he's basically saying grow up. Grow up, be a mature Christian, walk by faith, live that way. 
Christ has come. Don't put yourself back on the wall. Verse 3. So also when we were children, chapter 4, verse 3, when we were children, again, just illustrating, we were in slavery. Did you ever feel like a slave as a kid, a servant? Your teacher said do this. Your dad said do that. Your mom said do that. You know, you get pushed around. Finally, become a teenager. You start to rebel, right? And that can be childhood for people. You know, some kids are very docile. Very, they want to please you. We love children like that. I was probably like that as a little kid, but then I hit the teen years, right? <laughs> and then, you know, it's what I wanted to do, not what mom wanted me to do. And that's all he's talking about. When we were children, we were in slavery in a sense. We were in bondage in a way. We were under the basic principles of the world or the elements of the world. And that's a tough translation there. It has to do with learning your ABCs, that word there. But we learned our ABCs, right? You had or You had to learn them or you didn't move on to second grade. You know, you had to obey. In those days, it's true, isn't it? In those days, adults made kids mind. That's a foreign concept today. <laughs> but somehow they did, right? I mean, they made you mind. And this was what it was like to be under the law, so to speak. And there's a good reason why we make children mind. It's because kids are actually very selfish, aren't they? They're just born to be selfish as a child. Sometimes we think children are like the answer. I, I'm glad the whole world's not like little kids. I love little kids, don't you? I mean, they're great. But they're very self-centered. They want what they want. They want to do. They want to eat what they want to eat. They, they don't want to clean their room, right? They don't want to do their homework. They tend to be rebellious. Again, unless you have one of those, you bless one of those great grandkids, it's just perfect when she comes over or something. But so look what he says in verse 3. When we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. And that's not right, you see. It's not right as an adult. As an adult, you're supposed to grow up. You know, we have these sayings, some people never grow up. What are we really saying? They should grow up, right? It's time for them to grow up. You know, we sometimes say the only difference between men and boys is what? Price of their toys. What are we really saying? Guys, grow up. Life is more than snowmobiles and motorcycles. You know, grow up. It's not about toys. It's about being a good dad, about being responsible, about earning an income, about being there for your family. So we're saying grow up. So I, that's Paul's kind of saying that kind of thing to the legalists. We're trying to go backward. We better move on to point two here. <laughs> the dispensation of the law, if you want to add two words to the outline, is over. Second point, the incarnation of the Son has come. Number two. So, and we look at this verse and often during the Advent season, of course, verse four especially, four and five. When the time had fully come, or when the fullness of the time was come, what does Paul mean? God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. He may be thinking of the, his Jewish heritage, the period of the dispensation of the law. The time had fully come. Enough of that. The Jews had fully demonstrated that they couldn't keep the law, that they didn't keep the law. But maybe the whole world, right? The whole world had demonstrated. I mean, world wars and wars and rumors of wars and people not getting along and immorality, fornication and sin after sin and idolatry, all the sins of the world. Finally, God sends his son, right, in the fullness of time. God solves the problem that man couldn't solve. Man could never solve, right? Christ can solve the problem. What's your problem today? Christ can solve it, right? The Lord Jesus can do it. So he sent forth his son, born of a woman, the Virgin Mary, born under the law. He was a Jew, and he came to Jews, and he had Jewish parents, born under the law, the Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant. By the way, notice. Notice the words, God sent his son. He was already God's son when he was sent, right? Amen. He did not become God's son at the incarnation, at the, as the Holy Spirit came to Mary and she was with child. No, he was already the son when he was sent, right? He's the second person of the Trinity. He, he's sent. So that's kind of tucked in there, but I see that there. So... Born of a woman, you know the story, right? Virgin womb, nine months in a woman's womb. The son of God. Just think about that. Wow. Born in a feeding trough. Growing up under the law, keeping that law perfectly. Not sinning. I tell you a mystery. Behold, the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. It is a deep and unfathomable truth that God could enter human flesh. But that's how he saves us. He had to be perfect man, a perfect God, 
die on the cross to save us. And this is what God does for us. And so, of course, Paul is emphasizing here, we're in this new dispensation. Maybe you don't like that word, this new time period, this new era. We're in the church age now. Get rid of that old age. That's done. It's wrapped up. Jesus proved it with the resurrection, right? If there was no resurrection, there's no proof. You could just say, oh, he died as a martyr. He bled and died. A lot of people died. A lot of people were crucified. But it's his resurrection, right? That's the power. And we, too, live a resurrected life, the Pentecostal power of the Spirit. Amen? This is the way we're supposed to be living. This is the power that we have. It's a new era, a new day. Remember, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, I became a man, I put away childish things. That might be one of the things Paul's saying there. I put away all that old legalistic stuff. And he talks about it in Philippians and elsewhere, doesn't he? He had his whole great Jewish heritage and everything, the way he was trained and brought up under the law. But he became a man, and he put it away. And that's kind of the same thing here. Let's look at verse 5. Again, God sent forth his son to redeem those under law. Who are those? Is that everybody in the world? Or is he talking mostly about the Jews, right? They're the ones under the law. God's special people. So Christ was sent first and foremost to the Jews. Now, now bear with me. But he, that we, so the we would be we Jews, if that's true that we might receive the full rights of sons that we never had. Moses had a deep and abiding relationship with the Lord, spoke to him face to face, but not the kind of relationship you can have with God yourself. To enter within the veil, Moses could only see the backside of the Lord. Jesus came to redeem all, it's true. All people. All and any can come and receive him as Lord and Savior. But he did come, first and foremost, to the Jews. You say, where do you get that? Matthew 15, right? Let's take a look. Remember the... Canaanite woman, or I believe sometimes they call her the Syrophoenician woman, Matthew 15. Now keep your finger in Galatians. We've got to go back there and wrap it up. But we're at Matthew 15. You remember the story? Sometimes you scratch your heads at a story like this, but this is the point of it, that he came to the Jews. This is chapter 15 of Matthew's gospel, verse 21, 15. 21, and the NIV heading there, the faith of the Canaanite woman. Okay. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. Hmm. So the disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. And he answered, well, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Right? The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs, their little dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Praise the Lord for the healing ministry of Christ. Was healed right then, as he says the word, but it's her faith, isn't it? But you see, there he's making the point. He came to Israel. They would, the gospel was to begin, and we see on the day of Pentecost, who is it that gets saved? They're all Jews. They've gathered for Pentecost, for the festival. They're all. All these people have come, and they've gathered together, all different languages, and that's why we had the gift of tongues, right? Because there's all these different people who come from the, the known world to celebrate Pentecost. And it goes to the Jews. So that's why Paul here, Paul is appealing. We'll go back to Galatians. To say, you guys should know better. You legalistic Jewish teachers, you've come down from Jerusalem. You're messing up these churches. You guys should know better. Didn't you hear what happened on Pentecost? Didn't you hear the ministry of Christ? Didn't you hear how Jesus taught in John chapter 8? If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. In that same chapter, Jesus calls the Jews sons of the devil because they weren't accepting his ministry. They weren't realizing the new dispensation had come, the Messiah had come. So we'll go back here, we've got to get to our third point. Uh, and I'll call your attention, verse five, Galatians 4, 5 in the King James Version. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. All right? So it seems to say that you were not adopted as a son before this, right? Through Christ, we can be adopted. It's a wonderful thing to be adopted. Maybe there's some here that were adopted. 
And I hope you were adopted into a wonderful family, that you were never felt to be anything less than full family. Right? We have a little adopted grandson, and we think of him fully and 100% family. Right? Because it's legal, it's official, it's actual. He is part of the family, just like all the rest of the grandkids. Right? This is the adoption. Look at verse 5. Again, the NIV doesn't use the word, although it uses the word full rights which is an interesting explanation, verse 5, to redeem those under law that we might receive the adoption, thus the full rights of sons. And the male there is important because it was the firstborn son, right, in the Jewish lineage and heritage and in the world, really. Maybe still today to some extent, right? That has the full rights. So I don't think he means to exclude women here. He wants to make the point of the full adoption, using the word sons there. Wonderful Greek word, adoption, used several times by the Apostle Paul in his writings and used in different ways. This is the key reference to speak of the way we generally think of adoption. It's part of our salvation, isn't it? Salvation, redemption, justification, all great T-O-N words, right? Adoption's one of those wonderful words that explains what it means to be a child of God, to be saved. You're adopted into the family. You're redeemed, right? You're justified. All of these things are true. All wonderful words, great theological words. I love theological words myself. I love them. I don't like new translations that leave out great theological words because we need to know these words. I know they say, well, people don't understand what it means anymore. Well, they need to learn what it means, right? Like justification and wonder and, and glory in what they mean. Let's do a little review here. Now, I think I'll just read for you. You can look up these if you want. The way Paul uses the word adoption. Uh, Romans 8 Verse 23 refers to our bodily resurrection, interestingly. Paul says, Romans 8, 23, we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So you're not fully adopted until the body's been redeemed, until the resurrection of your physical body. Some people don't seem to really believe in the resurrection of the body anymore. Well, you won't be fully the son or daughter of God until your body's brought up right out of the ground and taken to heaven in glorious resurrection power, just like Jesus. So that's, that's sort of another way he uses the word adoption in, in the sense of it. Because an adoption wouldn't be finalized until the person was there, right? Like our, the adoption of our grandson wasn't finalized until it happened in court. And there's a little guy in court, right? And his parents and his grandparents and his sisters and brothers and siblings and cousins and dozens and, you know, and, and he's there. And the judge sees this little boy, right, and makes it legal. So in a sense, ours isn't fully complete until the, the adoption, the redemption of our physical body. That's Romans 8.23. You can study it on your own. Romans 9.4. Paul refers it to his countrymen, the Jews, a different use of the word. He says, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. So there was a sense in which the Jews were adopted, weren't they? Adopted of God. Not because of their goodness, right? If you go back and read the Old Testament, why did God work with Israel? Just because he's God and he does what he wants, right? He chose Israel. He chose them. They would be his chosen people. And he adopted them in a sense. Not the full adoption we have here, but that's Romans 9.4. And they had the covenants, the glory, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, Paul in Romans. Ephesians 1, 5 is a great one. Again, you can write these down. These are good cross-references on adoption. Paul speaks of God having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So there, adoption relates to your predestination, your election. You were elected to be adopted, right? Again, Ephesians 1, 4, having predestined us to adoption. So it's no mistake that you've been adopted of God. God planned it from the beginning, right? Doctrine of election, right? Predestined us to adoption. When we think about a little toddler being adopted, I mean, that's not his will. It's the will of the parents. It's the will of the judge, right? The little kid doesn't even know if it's a little toddler being adopted or whatever. You know, I'm just going to live where whoever brings me my food. So it's the same kind of thing. I mean, God makes a decision on adoption, right? It comes from the higher power. So that's Ephesians 1.5. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. 
aren't you? And you are a part of that family by grace through faith, but also by adoption, right? Because it's not natural for us to be in this family. It's not natural because we're sinners. We should be condemned and judged for our sin. Total depravity, right? I mean, every, everybody, everybody's a sinner except Jesus. So we don't belong in the family, but we've been adopted in, right? <laughs> Praise God. It's not a blood thing. So it doesn't matter what your blood is, your history. You can do all the genetic research you want, but that has nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter where you're from in this big world. You've been adopted. So close look at verse 6 here. Because you are sons, sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son, verse 6, into our hearts. Notice this verse carefully. The spirit who calls out Abba Father. Who calls out Abba Father? Not you, the spirit of God within you. Isn't that wonderful? If you feel like you have such a close relationship with the Lord, that like Jesus, you will say, Abba, Father, it's the Spirit of God within you, doing that in you, granting you that kind of personal relationship where he's your papa, he's your daddy. The Aramaic word a little softer than, than the Greek word for father. He's your, your dad. Right? This is the idea. It's the Spirit of God. Notice it carefully. Let me read Romans 8, 15. Good cross-reference. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, by the spirit. Both verses, both that, that's Romans 8, 15, and this one here, verse 6, teach the same thing. It's the spirit of God who enable us to say, Abba. We cry out, the spirit speaking through us. Maybe with groans that cannot be uttered. Maybe it's not necessarily the actual word, Abba, but it's the relationship where you can almost climb up into your dad's lap and talk with him and listen to him. And that's the kind of thing that Paul's talking about. We know Paul had that kind of relationship, didn't he? I mean, God spoke to this man. God directed him. God warned him in his course of his career and his ministry. But the main point here, the adopted child is a son and daughter in a full and legal sense, and the same is true for us. We can have a living and vital relationship. How about Jesus in the garden? Remember? He used this word, didn't he? Garden of Gethsemane. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. That relationship that submits, right, to the Father. Even the Son of God. Jesus, the Son, submitting to the will of the Father. He's in the flesh. And the limitations of human flesh, to some extent, the pain right, of human flesh. And so he subjects himself to the Father in this deep and close relationship. And we can have, see, that teaches us that we can have the same kind of relationship with our Heavenly Father as Jesus did, right? Because the same Abba, he used it. Paul says, you use it too. This is you. This is who you are. This is you under the new dispensation. Notice here in verse 6 again. It's the Spirit of God within us. Let me read Romans 8, 15 again. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now we got one more verse, verse 7. And in the NIV, I like it, it says, So you are no longer a slave. So he's writing to the churches in Galatia, but he's hoping the legalists get their hands on this letter and read it. But he's worried about the people in the churches, that they're falling for this false doctrine. And he, he insists on their position. You see, this is an important aspect of Christianity. It's our position in Christ, right? It's not just how we feel and what we do and what we know. It's our position. We are in Christ, right? You are no longer a slave. You've been set free by the Spirit of God. So no longer a slave, but a son. And since you're a son, son or a daughter, a little extra bonus for you. God made you also an heir. What are we heir to? What are we inheriting? <laughs> we just keep going, right? Think about heaven. We don't even know what we're inheriting there. We're going to be like the angels, right? We have that reference. We're going to judge angels, actually, in glory. We can read about the 24 elders, Revelation. We get some idea of heaven. There's different scripture verses. We are heirs of all these wonderful things, things beyond our imagination. But even in this life, right, we're heirs today. The peace with pastors understanding, right, today. You're the heir of that. Claim it, right? Because it's yours. You rightfully have that peace. If you're an anxious person, nervous person, a worrier, 
claim it because you are the heir of the promises of God. So no longer a slave. The dispensation of the law is over. Verses 1 to 3. Verses 4 to 5, the incarnation of the Son has come. Very familiar there. And verse 5 kind of overlaps. So the adoption of the believer, verses 5 to 7, is real. It's actual. And so we've been set free. If we had more time, we could go to John 8. But Jesus, you remember what he said there. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Does that mean you could do anything you want? It means you're free of the burden of sin. You're not under that yoke of the law. You're able to serve in the newness of the Spirit. You're a new creature in Christ. So hallelujah, we are heirs. And Paul says, I think in Romans, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And uh, so together we want to enter into the full rights, and that's my final conclusion here, is really just to encourage us to enter into the full rights of our inheritance. This is ours. <laughs> we got to claim it and live it. And the world will see that, won't they? They'll see the difference and becomes a powerful witness to family and friends and neighbors when they see us really living out the full rights of the heirs, the sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah.